Hey guys, I'm sorry for last week. Um, I was very sick um, with an upper respiratory thing and with asthma, you have to be careful about that. So I was just trying to rest as much as possible and make sure that everything was copacetic before I started speaking again. So today we're gonna do a Bible study. Uh, I have a whiteboard just because for me it's gonna be a lot easier to use the whiteboard than it is anything else. So let me see something here. Yeah, all right. So <clears throat> I'm going to use this to show you guys some con some biblical concepts. And I'm calling this the the Christian life cycle because that is basically what we're talking about. We're talking about the cycle of a Christian's life. Everything we talk about today is interconnected and you're going to see how. At least that's what I'm going to try and show you, okay? So let's get into it. to talk about is relationships and relationships in Christianity do have hierarchy okay so that hierarchy is designed and starts with God right so we have relationships I'm gonna write this down relationships our top number one relationship is God okay that's number one he's our top he's the very first one we ever deal with he's the very first one we have to we have any fealty to anything like that any any way that you think of a relationship it's God okay so we do what he wants above what our family wants he does we do what he wants above what the church says we do what he wants above what we want we do what he wants above what the government wants so the government wants you to do X God says do Y, we do Y. If your family's like, that's not right, um, but God says it is, we do what God wants, we don't listen to our family, okay? If the church is participating in something or asking you to do something that is not godly, guess what we say? No, <laughs> okay, we do something else. All right, so the way that we uh, develop this relationship with God is through prayer, okay? and reading our Bible. Prayer and Bible reading. I'll say more than just Bible reading, but Bible study, okay? Because you should be really thinking about what God's saying. You should be letting him talk to you through prayer. All right, all of this is very, very important. It's the number one thing you should work on every day, all the time, in good times and bad times and everything, all right? There's protection from God. There's beauty in God, things like that, that you need. Okay. So number two, and this is the hierarchy is family. All right. God says, and the reason I put family above church is because in first Timothy, let's see, I wrote it down. Hold on. First Timothy five, eight. I'll look it up right quick and just read it for you guys because that might be the easiest way to do this. Let's do this. First Timothy 5.8. All right. So I'm using BibleGateway.com. I'm going to go to the read the full chapter. First Timothy 5. I'm going to come down to the verse 8. So, all right. I'm going to do verse 7. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay. Um talks about widows no widow may be put on the list of widows until she's over 60 etc so this is this one verse here seven and eight is why i say family comes after god because basically if you neglect your family you're worse than someone who doesn't believe in god and someone who doesn't believe in god god says hellfire for them okay so it's very very important you do not neglect your family you do not leave them somewhere you do not you know, just be like, oh, figure it out. You do not do that, okay? 
God's very, very family oriented. All right. So family, you need to be dealing with your family. There's another, <clears throat> the way that you do that is through the relational situation, right? So if something happens, I am to defer my brother, defer my husband, etc. Somebody wants me to go do something. It doesn't even matter what, it could be something as simple as my friend wants me to go and work with her or go shopping with her or go do whatever it is, right? If my husband says, I really don't want you to do that. I need you to stay home for whatever reason I stay home. All right. My husband in the same situation, the guys or his or his family even is saying, well, we want you to come do this. We want you to do this. If I say, okay, I really would rather just stay home today. There's things we need to deal with. Then he is to listen to me and we stay home and do that. Okay. Now, again, like I've said before, I did a whole video on, uh, moderation. Okay. Mo you're not to just keep somebody at home. However, there may be, you know, good reasons to do that. It might be just that you're sick and you don't want to deal with it. It's better to stay home. Okay. It's just, it just is. All right. So family is next and you're going to develop those relationships with your family by spending time with them, getting to know them trying to understand them and, and deal with them. Okay. This is not an easy thing. It takes a lot of time to develop a relationship with someone where you understand them. You can see where they're going with something. You, you know, you, you have to talk to people. You have to open up to them. These, that's what these things are about. Uh, support money. All right. Money should be flowing through a family that that's my understanding of money. Like I said before, in Christianity, money is a tool. I've made a video on this too. It's a tool for defense. It's a tool for support. It's a tool for, to make sure everybody's needs are met. All right. Uh, then you can start talking about, well, maybe, you know, I'd like to help you get something you want or you like, or you desire or things like that. Okay. That is just a very, this, this, all of this is very parsed down. All right. I give you some examples and some verses, but as you go through and you read the Bible, it's very clear that our money, our time, the things that matter to us our all of our stuff is for the development of, of good relationships between ourselves and God and ourselves and family and ourselves in the church and then ourselves and friends. Okay. I'm going to give you some guidance into that, but guys, you really need to be reading your Bible and looking for this and meditating on his word. Again, that's step number one. So number three, all right, is you. So you put aside what you want for what God wants, you can put aside, or you put aside what you want for what family wants to a, to a point, right? <clears throat> because that's how you develop relationships. That's how you come to understand people a lot better. Um, what people used to teach was if, you, if the family's going somewhere and you don't want to go there, you find it boring, go anyway, just to spend time with those people. All right. A lot of times going on a trip doesn't have to be about, well, I get something from this or I'm in, I'm going to enjoy this a lot. So I will go. A lot of times you, when you see people in these places where they really enjoy or whatever, you can make bonds that way. And I've done that. It's, it doesn't cost you anything. You might be a little bored or whatever, but you learn a lot about the people that you're going with. Now I'm writing some verses down here for our next thing, which is you, right? I got one more verse. And I'm going to look one up because they're basically all the same vein. Let's see. They're basically all telling you to put yourself aside and go with either God or consider your brother. Okay. Or even I'll tell you the Bible story. Okay. So the, 
one of the major ideas in Christianity for when it comes to you, right? I'm going to read Romans 6, 6. All right, that's the first thing I'm going to read. So Romans 6, 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. All right, so in this, this idea of you is constantly the idea that you are to set aside sinful desires. Okay, we just start there and, and kill them off with the uh, help of God. All right, God is the one that helps you in your, in, come back to verse, to the first thing, God and prayer is what's going to help you do that. It's what's going to help you keep your family together. It's what's going to help you become this, this person that God wants to see. All right, let's do Ephesians 4.24. I'm actually trying to find, or is it four? Yeah, 424. Whoops. I didn't spell it right. Put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So again, guys, we're constantly working on ourselves. We are not to be these people who are not working on ourselves. We don't think about what we're doing. We don't think about <clears throat> things that we're watching, reading, eating, whatever, okay? We are to be these people who are thoughtful, all right? And then that is a, that is a challenge, I understand. Because most of the time, you're told, you are not told to think. You are told that if, if somebody just hands it to you, it's good enough. Well, no. Think about what they're handing to you. Again, in Galatians 6.15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything what counts is the new creation okay so the clothes that you wear the house that you have the land that you own the jewelry that you have the car the shoes whatever it is that makes you think you are a good person or you have value because of that that ain't it it's the new creation and you get to be a new creation through your relationship with God. So again, I'm going to show you why I call it a cycle. Okay. So you are trying to be a new creation, right? That is going to affect the family, how you care for them, how you deal with them, how they deal with you. And all of that is going to be precipitated by the prayer and the Bible reading in your relationship with God. So all of this is interconnected. You can't, you, if you're doing this, this and this will become better. If you're trying to do this, this and this will help you with that. If you're trying to be better, this and this will help you with that. Okay, it is all interconnected. If I could draw, you know, I think God likes circles a lot. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, I don't know. But all of this is interconnected and we're just three steps in and this is going to be a long video i'm warning you but we're just three steps into this okay we haven't even gotten to the rest of it yet <laughs> okay so that's relationship so church is your next layer of relationship all right a lot of us as christians oh okay so before i go actually you all right one last thing think of it like this too there's a story, a biblical story, of the Good Samaritan. Now I'm going to come back to that. That is an example of you doing what's right, okay? And how, even though you expend money for someone you don't know, you expend time, you expend care, all these things that the world tells you not to do, you that is what god wants you to do all right <clears throat> so that's actually going to come down to number six but i'll show you again how it's all connected okay so i'll go back number four church so church is not a building it is the body of christ all around the world right so wherever it is you are pick a church go there as long as it is a bible believing church i can't believe i have to say this right now but <clears throat> nowadays you just never know right as long as it is a bible believing church you are participating in church now this is something that god tells us to do 
in lots of different ways. Where are my Bible verses for this? Oh, I didn't write one down for church. Okay, so church, it tells you not to, um, oh no. I keep thinking I already know it, so I don't, I don't need it, I guess. So let's look it up. Okay, so you're not to um, forsake the gathering together of yourselves. Do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves. Okay, and that is participation in the greater, oh, there it is, it, it's in Hebrews. That is a partic participation in the greater and broader idea of relationship in God, right? So Hebrews 10.25. So write that down Hebrews 10 25 and I'm gonna put it up here for you to see so I'm reading Hebrews 10 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching so it's not just don't ignore the church you're in church to help each other you're in church so that God can do what he needs to do through hit the body. All right. And that is to reach the world with evangelism. We, when we come together for church, it is for purpose. It's to encourage each other through songs and spiritual psalms, through prayer, through just interacting with each other, because we know that we have these same values. You can find your and I'm not saying that you will, but you can find your spouse at church. You will find some of the greatest friends you've ever had at church. You will find a place of refuge at church. God works his biggest um, miracles and his biggest uh, effects through the church, his people. So if you're not in church and you're a Christian, you don't need it for salvation, but you do need it for you. Okay, you do need it to see God working all the time. I have the strength of my faith, not just because I believe it because of what I saw, but because when I go to church, I hear about what God has done. All right. Or I see people praying because prayer, as we've gone over before, has an effect. Okay. So this idea is not just, oh, go to church so I can give them money. If you have something in your heart that says, well, I don't want to give anybody money and you're still there. Okay. Everybody, some, you know, a lot of people start there. If you're still there where you don't want to give them money because you think it's not, then don't, but go to church. Okay. Take your tithe money and give it to an orphanage for all I care. You still need to be in church. All right. You will eventually come to understand tithing a lot better as you talk with people. Okay. As you read your Bible and as you pray. All right. So I'm not worried. I personally am not worried about whether or not you tithe, but I am concerned for you watching this. If you're not going to church, it is a big deal when, when, when things go down in, in life, because they will, the church is there to help you. Your friends are there to help you. Your family's there to help you. You have now, and so is God, the way that all of this is interconnected. All right. You have as a Christian, let me make sure I've got this on the screen here. You have one, two, three layers of protection, help, fun, etc. right here. Okay. It's not hard to see how these are all interconnected, but if you don't ever really think about it, then, you know, you, you're not going to see it, I guess. <laughs> but once you start thinking about it, it's like, oh yeah, duh. Okay. I got this now. Okay. So friends friends is number five. So what did I write on here? So friends and neighbors, I have these in sort of different categories. Okay. But they are, they are basically very similar categories. Friends and neighbors. I have friends of different belief systems. I have friends who are like family. I have friends who know me for a very long time, but we never hang out. I have friends who barely talk to me, but I consider them 
a friend, okay? What this really is, though, when you when you read the Bible, you don't ever read the Bible and see the word friend unless it's talking about <clears throat> you are a friend to God, okay? <clears throat> Sorry. So friends and neighbors, they basically, they intertwine, okay? A neighbor is anyone that's near you, like physically near you, they live in your town, you see them, etc. If you're out traveling, that person sitting next to you, they're your neighbor, okay? You're not supposed to harm them, etc. You're supposed to help them. So there are a lot, excuse me, of, you have neighbors everywhere, right? Friends, to me, as far as I understand, are people that God puts into your life for an extended period of time. And you guys are on mission together. All right. So the church, the people that you connect with the best at church can be like your friends. Okay. The neighbors that you have in your, what, let's like say your neighborhood or people you travel with or you're in a group with or whatever could be your friends. Okay. But you're going to choose friends or you're going to have friends based on the church and your neighbors. So all of those three are interconnected as well. <clears throat> The Bible has a lot to say about your neighbor, all right? And so I personally just put these in together because there's nothing that you don't do to a neighbor that you wouldn't do for a friend. The Bible does have one verse that says there's a friend who is there for you during, during, during hard times, who's willing to die for you. Okay, so that is the one way that it differentiates friendship from neighbors. Not everyone in the church is going to be willing to die for you. <laughs> Not everyone in the church is going to be there when you have difficulty or adversity. All right. Um, so that is a way that it does differentiate it. A friend sticks closer than a brother. Right. So there is a, a closeness there when it comes to friends. But the way you treat them is basically the same. Right. <clears throat> so let's read a couple Let's see. So I have several, and I'm going to put all of these Bible verses and everything down in the description. So let's read a couple. I'm going to look them up. I wrote them all down on these notes. Let's just do Luke 10. Luke 10. 25 through 37. Oops, 25. Okay, so this is, this is a story or a piece of history, and this is Jesus talking to a lawyer. <clears throat> and behold, a lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What's written in the law? What have you read? And he says, Love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind, so that's everything you are, and your neighbor as yourself. He says to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, who's my neighbor? Jesus answering said in a parable, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he just went to the other side of the road and kept walking. Likewise, a Levite came, looked at, looked at him, passed by on the other side of the road. But a Samaritan, as he walked, saw him and had compassion on him and went to him, bound up his wounds, poured oil on them and wine, set him on his beast, which is usually a burrow, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So this Samaritan stopped what he was doing, picked this guy up, tended his wounds, put him on his beast, and took him to some place where he could take care of him. <clears throat> the next day he departed, 
took out money, gave it to the host and said to him, take care of him and whatever you spend more when I come again, I'll pay you back. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the guy who was mugged? And the lawyer says, the one that showed mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. <clears throat> Nowadays, we look at that and go, well, that's what I would do for my friend. I wouldn't do that for just somebody laying on the road. But God says, your neighbor is the one who takes care of you. Your neighbor is the one that's lying on the road who needs help. Somebody who needs help, somebody who's out here by you, somebody who's in it, that's who your neighbor is. All right. People get this mixed up a lot of times where somebody, you are just supposed to help people because they are your neighbor on this world <laughs> because they need help. This guy in here, this Samaritan took his, took time, took a day because he, he stayed with him until the next day and to stop what he was doing, pay money for him, take care of him. He does not know this man. He has never seen this man before in his whole life. And that's what he did. And God said the Samaritan was a neighbor to that man because of the care and the mercy he took on him. Okay. This is what the, the Bible has a very, uh, deep, how do I say this? It's a very deep, uh, line, or it shows a very deep line from person to person. <clears throat> All right. So friends, you do even more for, right? You make sure they're taken care of almost like family. Okay. But the outcome is the same. This guy, the Samaritan, and he will be friends now because he has taken care of him. All right. So they intertwine like that. <clears throat> so that's the biblical story for it. Let's read another one. Romans. Let's try Romans. Let's see. Is there any Old Testament I've written down here? Eh, no, not really. Okay. So let's do Romans 14.1. Oh, him that is weak in the faith, receive, but not to argue with. All right. So the reason I wrote this down <clears throat> is basically because somebody could be very weak in the faith, not understand things, not even want to understand them. Deal with them anyway. Right. This goes back to mercy, to what we saw with the Samaritan. You're not dealing with people because they're good to you. You're not dealing with people because they're nice people. You're not dealing with people because they're rich, because they're poor. It is not a, there's not a differentiation for you in that. What it is, is God wants you to deal with people, period. He wants you to have mercy on them. He wants you to try with them. He wants you to show them the way, okay? <clears throat> people often say, that that doesn't happen anymore. Well, it's because people have lost this teaching, right? And this is in the Bible everywhere. I've got one, two, three, four, five, probably seven, eight more verses that are similar to this. Okay. You would do this for a friend. If a friend was being stupid, you would still receive them, not to argue with them, not to try and make them see your way, but to help them understand what's true. Okay, so let's try, let's try Matthew 542. Give to him who asks, and from him that would borrow, don't turn away. All right, somebody asks you for money, just give it to them. <clears throat> if they want to say, oh, let me borrow this, just give it to them. Give it to them as a gift. If they want to pay you back, that's fine. If they don't, don't worry about it, right? This is again mercy. This is again how God deals with people, how he wants you to deal with people. It's how he deals with us. It's how he wants us to deal with each other. You do this for anyone, your neighbor. Your neighbor is this person over here asking you for money. And this ties into what I want to go into next, which is money. Okay. Now I'm going to erase my board really quickly. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so we have, well, okay, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself actually. So you can see now how everything is connected. Okay. Everything here helps you with everything else. 
And all of this helps you become a better person, a person after God's own heart. So there's nothing here that will interfere with, you know, you doing what you're supposed to do. And all of it's connected. It goes up and down, around, however you want to say it. If you're helping people out like this, God sees that. Family sees that. Neighbors see that. Other neighbors see that. Friends see that, etc. And that changes their outlook. They may ask you questions. They may take it on as, well, this guy's doing it. I'll do it too. And so we have a better society in that way. Um, they will then... You can then talk to them about the Bible, about God, and evangelize in that way. So all of this is interconnected. There's nothing here that you do that doesn't help you with something else or that doesn't put you in a better place. Okay. So let's talk about money, baby. Everybody likes money, right? Okay. So we're going to do money. Money's going to be purple. So I wanted to do a different color. <laughs> all right. Money is a tool. God doesn't say too much about money. He has one thing, you know, everybody likes to say the one thing. You don't fall in love with it, right? I mean, everybody knows that one. I'm going to try and look it up. Uh, money is a defense. There is, where, what happened to my, it's like my, it's a tool. Okay, it's a tool. Let's look these up. Money is a defense. I just read this. It's in Isaiah. I'm pretty sure. No, no, it's in Ecclesiastes. I messed it up already. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ecclesiastes 7.12 Okay. For wisdom is a defense and money is a defense but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to them that have it. Alright. So it talks about money being a defense. We can break that down real quick. Alright. So money is a defense. How? So money is a defense because you can literally buy def a defense, right? If you are going up against someone in the court system, you can buy a lawyer. So a literal meaning, lawyer. <laughs> okay, if you have no money, you don't get a good lawyer, and so you don't get a good defense, all right? And that's just true for life. Um, let's see. Spiritual. We'll just call it that. Spiritual. Okay. Uh, you get to care for people. And then we'll say church. Support. Great commission. Okay. I don't know how to spell commission, so I'm just going to spell it however I think it's spelled. <laughs> okay, so literal, we just said lawyer, right? If you have money, you can get a good lawyer and you can get a good defense. <clears throat> when it comes to caring for people, people get sick. You can defend against that by being able to buy them, you know, cold medicine, whatever it is, right? Taking them to the hospital, taking them to the doctor, getting their getting their uh, bones set if it's broken. You can. This is a defense, as in you can you can with money put people in safe places. Uh, whether you buy some land and uh, build houses for them, um, or you go into business with each other and you have money, and so you can go do all these things, right? <clears throat> you can literally buy. A home defense system, okay? You won't go hungry. Defends against hunger. <clears throat> you won't have major, you know, it just, any, anything you can think of, if you have money, you can do it. Money is important. It's not the first thing. It's not the major thing. The first thing is your relationship with God. But it is an important tool. And I think I have church at the bottom. So church at the bottom. 
would be the way that you evangelize to people. So the biggest way is personally, all right, personally. If I am talking with someone, I am in the mind of to evangelize to them in some way. Take them out to lunch. Let's go have fun. Let's be friends and stuff. Hopefully, you know, we're already friends, but you see my point. Uh, the church that I'm part of has a food truck. The food truck is, goes out and it serves the homeless. We cannot buy food. We cannot put gas in that car, or truck rather. We cannot keep the upkeep of that truck without money. Okay, so money is a tool and is a defense. You can care for your family for their needs. You can care for the church and you can care for the poor. Without money, I cannot buy the poor clothes. I cannot buy them food. I cannot get them a job. I cannot, you know, all of these ways that we help them is through money. All right. Again, we're not to love money. Money is not this, this thing that we love. It is our tool to be used correctly. All right. <clears throat> Let me see if I can find that right quick and I'll read it to you. Okay. The Bible, love of money. Oh, that's in Timothy again. Guys, read Timothy. It's good. <laughs> All right. Do, 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 do. Here it is. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Okay. Some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. All right. So we're not out here trying to be working so hard for our million or whatever, you know, whatever number you want to put out there. I just say a million because that's what everybody seems to want. Okay. <clears throat> we're not out here working so hard that we neglect our family, we're, we neglect our church, we neglect our relationships and our area. But we are hard workers. We are investors. That is who we are as Christians, okay? If you view money as the goal for life and not relationships with people and not caring for people and all this, you will wander away from the word this what did this say let me read it again i gotta find it again oh they fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction okay you trying to run after this money and seek after it will harm yourself you'll lose the money uh the money you'll get it and then lose it all anyway just don't let that be what your life is about, okay? You can make money slow and steady like a turtle. You can make it money, you can make money quick if you have a way to do that. But the point to getting the money is not so that you can live a lavish lifestyle and do nothing. Okay, the point to having the money is to support people. You've got people in the church to help, you've got your friends to help, you've got that neighbor to help. You've got the poor, the widows, the orphans. There's a lot to do with your money. So it needs to be invested wisely so that it is working while you're sleeping. You need to put it where God tells you to put it. Okay. It tells you in there, I just read it. If somebody just asks you for money, give it to them. Okay. Which means when we manage our money as a Christian, we should have a portion that is set aside to just give away for somebody who asked you for money. All right. And that's on top of tithing. That's on top of widows and orphans. That's on top of the poor and all this stuff. <clears throat> we make money so that it can flow from, from God to us, from our hand to where he wants it to go. That's why we make a lot of money. Okay. It's not per se. So we can have a big house and a bunch of cars or whatever. Now, again, though, I'm not saying that that's wrong, but what I am saying is that if you make a bunch of money, it should be to support other people. Okay. And that is from the biblical mindset of doing things. Like he's, like we said before, the relationships are first. That's why I did it first. Uh, all of these relationships are intertwined 
And money is one of the ways that you can make life easier for people. It's not the only way. It's not even sometimes the first way, but it is one way to make things a lot easier for people. Okay. The world. This is the third one and the final one. Okay. So the world, big deal. It's where we live. Everyone we come in contact with lives here. All our neighbors. <laughs> okay. They all need some kind of help. They all need some kind of something. All right. <clears throat> Our biggest job with the world is to evangelize them. Um, we're supposed to be active in it. We're not supposed to be passive. We're not supposed to do what the Amish do, for example, and go off and have our own things and never interact with the world. That's not it. Okay. So I've got a few verses here. The biggest way we talk about this as Christians is the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is to go out and tell the world, all the world, about Jesus Christ and the good news. All right. So that's, that's the first thing. That's, that's the first thing when we're out here dealing with the world that we should be thinking about. All right, let's try. I have Matthew 28 written here, 16 through 20. Whoops. I said 25, 28. Or I wrote 25. Let's try again. All right. Uh, yes, the Great Commission. Okay. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. I'm going to write that down, put it up here while I read it. Great Commission. Ooh, I spelled it right too. M-M-I-S-I-S-S-O-N, kind of like Mississippi. Okay, so the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this is something we do with God. Again, guys, go back to relationship. Very first one, God and you, you and God, you're out here doing your thing. Okay. It's great. So that's the very first way we deal with the world. It's active is not passive. We're out here doing what we're supposed to do. So I have some other ones. Let's look them up and see what I said here. <laughs> because basically we deal with the world this way because that's what we're told to do because it gets people to a better place, right? It's better to be a Christian than it is to not be. <clears throat> 2.14. I've got 1 Corinthians 2.14 down here. Let's see what it is. Oh, okay. So the reality of the world is that it does not understand the Bible. Okay. Does not understand. And that's what first Corinthians 2.14 is all about. Okay. Does not understand. So when you're out here and they're like, what? apologize. I wouldn't apologize for that. Or they're like, what? Forgive them. No, that's dumb. Or like, what? Just give money away. No, you don't get anything for it. That's dumb. What? They don't understand. They're not working with God to do these things. They don't understand the constructs that God set up. Okay. You're going to get weird, weird looks is what I'm saying. <laughs> right? So first Corinthians two fourteen, the person without the spirit, the Holy spirit, does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. All right, so this can only, a lot of this can only be understood. You can only really see it if you are a Christian. All right, and so we want everyone to understand the way the world works. We want everyone to understand the 
cyclical nature of things, how everything is tied together. Men and women are tied together, whether they're related or not. Um, you know, everything out here is. Food is tied to money. Health is tied to, you know, <clears throat> my grass outside. <clears throat> Excuse me. Things like that. Everything is tied together. So let's see what else I got here. <clears throat> I've got Ephesians 4. 18. So what is this? What is this? Oh, same thing. They are darkened in their understanding. It's separated from the life of God because the ignorance that's due that's in them due to them hardening their hearts. So there you're going to come across people who just don't understand, but are curious. You're going to come across people who have hardened their hearts against this. You'll, this is atheists sound this way. Agnostics sound this way. People who say, I just don't see the point to believing in God or what the point is to religion. Okay, they've hardened their hearts against it, all right, and they're not going to understand, and they're, they're going to be separated from the life with God, and that is a sad thing, but this is what's real in the world. These have other consequences. All the stuff I'm telling you about before where we're all helping each other, the money flows around to each other, nobody, can, nobody should ever have um, need, <coughs> excuse me. They're not ever going to see that. They're not going to see the point to that. They're not going to understand why you would do that. To them, it looks like they work hard so this other person can can live well. It looks like socialism to them. That's why you hear them all the time. Well, the Bible is socialist. No, it's not. But anyway, as a Christian, you understand it's not. Okay, because you have the Holy Spirit to guide you. Let's see. Let's see. What else do I have? Let's see. Matthew 22, 15 through 22. <laughs> How about that? All right. This seems to be another story. Okay. And this is what I was talking about before with the money. <clears throat> this is how you deal with government. Okay, so I'm going to make that number three, government. I rant all the time on this channel about government, how I think it's too big, how I don't want it, how I hate taxes, etc. <clears throat> so this is what Jesus says about all this, okay? And this is also why we don't have to worry too much about stuff, okay? We just have to do, we just have to follow the layout he has and we won't have to worry about too much at all, really. 15 through 22. How do I say? Okay. All right. So the government, Matthew 22, 15 through 22. I wrote on there, give it money. <clears throat> and here's why. The Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Jesus, knowing the evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Go give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. I don't know if you'd notice this, guys, or not, but when you're looking at your money, any money throughout the whole wide world has some guy's face on it, right? Usually a dead guy. <clears throat> Usually, even if you're going to look at, like, uh, silver bars, gold bars, something like that, it has a stamp on it because, you know... The government has to stamp everything. It's theirs. They pee on everything. <laughs> okay. If you were to put it that way. So. The money that we make. Alright. This ties into money. 
ties into people again. All right. The money that we make has dead guys on it because these dead guys created the institution of money to begin with, right? They're the ones who, who they create the denarius, they create the dollar, they create the ruple, they create the whatever it is so that we all can trade with each other in a more even playing field, they say. So, <clears throat> God says, if you have a tax, all right, or you have... Yeah, if you have a tax, pay it. Just give them, just give them the money. In another, uh, in my taxes video, I talked about the temple tax that people had back then. He says, go to a fish. And he said this to a disciple, go into the water, get a fish, and bring out the amount of temple tax from the mouth of that fish. All right. Money is about the most, it's the lowest, how do I say it? God is not worried about you getting money. He can get you money. In my, part of my, um, what's it called? <laughs> Where you tell people about your relationship with God. Testimony. <clears throat> is that not one time, not two times, three, four, five, six times, I have had money just appear. All right for me when I was in need. So money, just give it away. Give it to governments. Give it to people who ask it for you. Of you, I mean. Give it to the church. Give it to yourself. Give it to your family. Money is this thing the world craves. <clears throat> and God can give you all of it. We say a lot of times in the church, we have this phrase, <clears throat> my God's the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? It is a phrase from the Old Testament that talks about in the world, God owns everything. This is one of those things, again, like it says in 1 Corinthians, people don't understand because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have that door open to them. All right. So with the Holy Spirit, with the belief, you can understand these things. All right. So I'm going to close this up now. Uh, again, guys, this was just a really quick, or not quick, really, but <laughs> a really basic show of how things work, okay? So relationships and their hierarchies. I'm going to put that at the top. They flow right into money and what you're supposed to do with it, okay? Which flows right into government and how you're supposed to deal with them. Because, you know, there's people in government too. <clears throat> the government's going to want your money, as we all know. <laughs> Alright, so... Don't be... Don't be too... Don't worry. Alright, is what I'm trying to say. The Christian cycle. Okay. What I haven't said yet, because I can't draw, and I'm going to do this right quick. I'm going to draw this really quick because for me, it's just a much easier way of explaining it to you, really. Let's see, prayer. No, let's put the Bible on top. Yeah. I'm going to show you guys something right quick, okay? So this is how I draw this cycle, right? Let me make sure you can see it all. Hey! <laughs> okay. So you have the Christian cycle. Relationships, to money, to government, all of this is intertwined, and I've shown you how that is. But then we have this outside one that is above even this, which is where is your relationship with God, the very first thing I talked about. Bible comes to you, you come to understand certain things, you pray, 
God refines it for you into actions. Did you then go read your Bible? You come to better understanding, more prayer, more actions. Okay. And this is the cycle right here. This is the outer cycle that starts it all. It's the first one that matters. This is the inner cycle where you can start to see practical Christianity. You can start to see, uh, well, practical Christianity. You can start to see it work. The more you do this, the more you understand this, the more this becomes, I guess, real to you. I don't know another word to say, but you begin to understand the interconnectivity of everything, right? You will begin to understand how, how just, I don't want to use the word easy because it is not per se easy, right? You're going to have struggles. You're going to have bad things happen to you. You're going to have things that happen in your life where you're like, why did this happen? I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do and it still happened. <clears throat> but with the understanding of the Holy Spirit, prayer, Bible reading, and your actions out into the world, you will start to see things move that you have never seen before. Excuse me. I have watched, I have been part of people's cancer being healed. I have been part of, like I said before, money just appearing for me. I have been part of relationships where someone didn't die because God told someone else to pray for them that they didn't even really know all that well. I have been part of situations where it's, it's a major thing. Government is coming after this person and then just all of a sudden the government doesn't care anymore. Okay. This all of this that I'm talking to you about is very real. It's all interconnected and you can't, for me, if you're going to be a Christian and that's why this is in the playlist it is, this is a very basic Bible study to understand the interconnectivity of everything. It's a big cycle. It is, um, <laughs> And you can't get out of it, basically. This is the cycle that matters. The cycle out here that people are talking about, where if you're online at all and you're paying attention to politics of <clears throat> um, global warming, people being poor, you know, not whatever it is you don't have, this cycle fixes that. You just, and I want you to think about it, all right? I'll give you one example. How would this fix? fix world hunger. Let's just think about it. If we each care for the person who is out there on the street, who is our family, we like, we know where they are, et cetera, like that. Right. And at the very least we bring them food to make sure they're not hungry. We fixed it on that level. So there's that one person. If we as a church go out and do like what my church is doing right now with the food truck, we're giving away food. That is a individual caring for an individual in the first example. That is the church, the body of Christ caring for the multiple individuals in one area. Multiply that by millions. In this case, whether you have, whether you have family that can look after you, or you have the church helping you, you are taken care of. What do we not need then? Government involvement, right? We don't need anybody, but the people around us. What does that take inside of you? Or uh, another one, a third one, you are the good Samaritan as what you are meant to be. You care for someone you don't know at all. That person is no longer hungry. That is what you do for this person. You feed them. Think about that society. Think about how just that one thing would change the world. All right. These concepts create a world where there isn't need and there isn't too much struggle. There still be struggle because people still make the wrong decisions, right? But there's a ways out of it. <clears throat> And there isn't too much struggle. I would encourage you guys, again, the, the church is like third down on my list here, not to get too, it's number four. Okay. 
not to get too caught up in what denominations have decided things say or how to do them or whatever, but to go to God and to read your Bible and decide for yourself how to do these things. If you think your church is doing a great job and that's where you want to put your time and energy, then do that. All right. I'm not saying don't, but what I am saying, and like I've said before about tradition and things like that, the Bible and God are our guides. The Holy Spirit tells you, this is how you're going to do this. And this is how it's going to happen. <clears throat> if we all did that, if we all followed what the Bible said about just hunger, if we listened to the Holy Spirit and he led us to where to go, everything would be covered. All right. It doesn't take, and it doesn't even take that much to feed somebody. Think about how much it would take to maybe feed somebody a day. You make one extra portion of your meal, right? So again, think about how much, how the stereotypes of money are different for things. Think about the relationships of things. Okay. The Bible has a lot to say about relationships. It is a book about relationships to you and God, which is number one, you and your family, you take care of them or you're worse than an infidel, right? They're high up there. They're, they're higher than the church. They're higher than your friends. <clears throat> Our relationship to money is a tool that flows through us. All right. We're not, we, we can have emergency funds and things, but the stockpiling is not supposed to happen. You know, um, there's all of these, there is so many different ways that it would create a good world, just world, even just change your area that as each individual does their part works with the church to do it, listens to God and what they're supposed to do, is the good Samaritan, is the caring brother in adversity, is all of these things, you would see a drastic change. <clears throat> now, I have to admit something. Another history of Andrea here <laughs> is that because I grew up poor, I could not let go of money. Money <clears throat> for me has been so hard to even get because I was not following these concepts. Okay. Through most of my life that now that I have money. All right. It's hard for me to let go. I have in the past two or three years been working on that. Hey, you have extra money. You have everything you need. You have an emergency fund start giving it away. And I just pray now, right now, what I do is I just pray and wherever he says to do it, however much that's where it goes. Okay. <clears throat> if you don't worry about your past, if you take your past and go, that's in the past, I'm with God now. <clears throat> He's going to do for me what he says, as long as I'm obedient. Right. And you start applying these things I'm talking about, read your Bible, guys, read your Bible, pray over it, think about it, dig into it. Don't just go to church and listen to what the preacher says. Don't just go to church and do a Bible study. Don't just do that. Get in here personally, because again, your number one priority in your life is your relationship between you and God. And he will route out things you didn't know you had problems with. And he will change you to a very stable person where money and love and peace and prosperity just flows right out of you. Okay. Discipline too, right? All of these things just flows right out of you. Okay. I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to end with what I usually say. Remember to pray and read your Bible. And I will see you next week, guys. All right. Bye.